Warning, this podcast contains all the kinds of language they have warnings for. This week's episode of The Skating Atheist is brought to you by one final round of our Alex Jones in five words or less contest. Today's winner is at Keith the Great 82, who had rabies, just rabies. Well done, Keith. Gravity wins. And by the way, I searched for Alex rabies on Google Images and Alex Jones was on the first page. True story. Anyway, next week's topic is Mike Pence in five words or less, which should be fun because he might already be the president by then. Tweet us your favorites using the hashtag Pence Scathe, and you could be the next winner. And now, Scathing Atheist. Hi, I'm Phil Davey. And I'm Leif Colt. We're from Reason is Rising, reminding you that small hands can make it difficult to grasp concepts. And in fact, that we did evolve from filthy monkey men. Ooh, ooh. Thursday. Yeah, it's May 18th. And we're a third of the way to Satan. I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. From New York, New York. In Secret Lair, Pennsylvania. This is Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, anti-Semites in Bangladesh text to vote for American idol worshippers. Anti-Semites in Norway might force Moyles to start blowing adults. And anti-Semites in the 1830s wrote a book. First, the diatribe. Kind of feels like the bills are coming due, doesn't it? I mean... Republican allies are describing the White House as a downward spiral. Nobody in the administration can even remember which lie they're defending anymore. And the press secretary is negotiating prices with the Overlook Hotel's labyrinth guy. This asshole is collecting impeachable offenses like they were trading cards. And the dumpster fire their train wreck caused has managed a nuclear meltdown through rock bottom. And yet, when you look at the latest polls, 38% of Americans think he's doing a bang up job. Who the fuck are these people? Well, when you break Trump's remaining support down into demographics, it's pretty fucking obvious because there's really only one demographic group that still largely stands behind him. And keeping in mind that racists and plutocrats aren't categories generally tracked by U.S. demographers, what segment of the population do you suppose that is? If you guessed evangelical Christians, congratulations, you are listening to the right show. So what exactly is an evangelical? Well, turns out that's a trickier question than a lot of you might think it is. It's not exactly a denomination. It's not exactly a theology. When evangelicals themselves try to define it, they resort to galactically wacky shit like the Bebbington Quadrilateral, which invokes the prototentious neologism cruciocentrism in its transparent effort to sound academic. But demographically speaking, basically what we're saying is white conservative Christian who isn't Catholic. They're, they're that immoral minority of people that dubbed themselves the moral majority back in the 80s. They're the Limbaugh-loving, lesbian-loathing yokels that clog up the sideways in front of abortion clinics and scream at Muslims for being brown. They're a demographic shorthand for the worst America has to offer. Now, I know I'm talking about your uncle and your cousin and your sister and your mom when I say this. I know I'm talking about people who are, on the whole, mostly really good people, pretty much All the people are, but the thing that unites evangelicals as a demographic, those things are entirely the bad shit, right? Tell me your sister and your mom would run into a burning building to save a stranger. Okay, well, they're also in some other demographic for altruistic or non-flammable people, but the demographic group that is evangelicals is a racially hegemonic group of people united by bigoted social policies, paranoid delusions of persecution, and a disdain for education and expertise. And when you break it down like that, It should surprise no one that they're the last group clinging to their support for a president who's racist, bigoted, delusional, paranoid, and profoundly inexpert. I mean, what could be more evangelical than ignoring facts? 
Ignoring science has been a cornerstone of their religious movement since 1859, at least, and a cornerstone of their religion since about 1543. Hell, it's not even right to call this a religious movement since in its modern form, it's always been a political endeavor. You know, Bebbington be damned. The unifying factor among evangelicals is conservative politics. The resurgence that put them back on the map came when they were fighting to keep prayer in schools and fetuses in utero during their Carter administration. It wasn't some great theological breakthrough or some philosophical epiphany that inspired this coalition. It was the collective perception of their eroding political power. You know, the Republican Party got in bed with him back in the late 70s, hoping to milk him with hollow promises of abortion restrictions and rounding up the immigrants and count on him to swing an election here and there. And for a couple of decades, that basically worked. But when you and a dragon are on either side of the same leash, you're only walking it for so long. So inevitably, the evangelicals who've been told over and over again by the politicians on their own fucking side that they don't need to trust science, their, their opinion is as valid as that of the experts, and the, the boogeyman really is coming to get their God and their guns, eventually those people decided to elect one of their own. Who'd have ever thought that was fucking coming? Now, somehow a lot of observers are looking at this and calling the evangelicals hypocrites for supporting this guy. You know, what with his divorces and his fucking over of the poor. But the only hypocrisy is pretending there's some hypocrisy in that. Oh, Trump treats women like garbage and doesn't understand who their genitals belong to? Doesn't give a flying fuck about the poor and blames them for their own plight? Ignores the advice of experts and plows ahead with whatever dumb shit pops into his head? I'm sorry, are we listing Trump's flaws or the evangelical political platform of the last four fucking decades? So the apologists for Christianity can piss away as much op-ed ink as they want, arguing that wearing the kilt and doing the voice does not a true Scotsman make. But this isn't a statistical fucking quirk. This is not a misunderstanding among ignorant evangelicals that can't figure out he's not really one of them. He is one of them. If you were trying to describe evangelicals to a foreign visitor, your best possible definition would be Trump supporter, both demographically and descriptively. This is what the evangelical movement has wrought, and I'm not going to waste any of my fucking effort helping them wash their hands of it. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the moose and squirrel of atheism, Eli Bosnick and Heath Enright. Fellas, can we make it through the headlines without divulging any secrets, you think? Um, I'm fired? <laughs> oh, I haven't accounted for this. Noah. Christian podcast. Me and Heath had a whole plan worked out, and I'm going <laughs> to have to update play. you. There's a lot of ramen stuff we're going to have to cut. <laughs> I made compromises for the whole Christianity thing. It was going to be great. I don't care about atheism. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that out of the way, the rest of this show is kind of superfluous. But uh, this is someone's the- first episode. <laughs> They're going to say, wow, that was a rough cut right there at the beginning. This is not well edited. In our lead story tonight, a violence erupted along the Congolese border of the Central African Republic last week when Christian militias took it upon themselves to make the Central African Republic great again by ridding themselves of Muslims. Andrew never lets us do anything. Don't push Nazis. Don't form a militia and clean out the Muslim ghettos. Blah, blah, blah. Thank Andrew. you, he. Oh, Two votes. I need to get Lucinda on board. She's always knitting. (laughs) She's not. You call my wife an old lady. Anyway, according to UN aid workers and officials, more than she's going to be here later in the show. I'm just telling you, I'm warning you, you should know that. Anyway, according to UN aid workers and officials, more than 30 civilians were killed in the melee and hundreds. And see, you hear what I'm saying of the words that I'm saying out of my mouth while you're doing this. Jesus Christ, I'm talking about dead people here. Have some respect. All right, so more than 30 civilians were killed in the melee and hundreds of Muslims were left seeking refuge inside a mosque in the nearby town of Bangasu, I think. Bangasu? I don't know. Uh, No word on the extremity of the mosque's vetting, unfortunately. So (laughs) I got a lot of terrorists and rapists in that mosque now. Just pointing that out. So Noah's either saying phase one complete or he's being sarcastic. I I was. And it's the second one. I knew the whole time it was the second one. I knew it was the second one. And of course, you're wearing a the, new hat. Have to I'm ask. wearing a new. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, this is just the latest outbreak of bloodshed and violence that's been ongoing in the Central African Republic since the Paleo Archean period. The rate of religious and ethnic violence has increased in recent weeks as the Ugandan government began withdrawing troops, though at the same time, the rate of sexual assault by Ugandan troops is way down. Hmm, so nice. you take the good with the bad. Yeah. Well, if Uganda is looking at your country going, fuck, these yokels need some Ugandan paternalism. That's, <laughs> right. that's not a great sign. 
So the ongoing conflict there has left one in 10 residents displaced and nearly half the country's population reliant on international aid, which is what Rush Limbaugh has been saying about them all along, y'all. See, <laughs> see, Noah should write a book. Oh, make a lot make of sure money use, on that yeah, book. Yeah, make sure you use Nazi graffiti as your sources and only <laughs> send it to me and Heath before you publish it, though. I'm going to tweet it to you one <laughs> line at a time. Now, nice. I, I want to be clear here because every time I do or don't cover a story about non-Muslim terrorism, I get shit from some subsection of our listenership. So, yes, <laughs> this is a story of violent Christian terrorism. Yes, this is a thing that happens. But when we come across these stories, we should still keep them in perspective. Okay, quick list here from Wikipedia of the perpetrators or suspected perpetrators of terrorist acts with multiple fatalities in May of 2017. This is Myself a longer excluded. list than you were hoping it would be. It's going to have some dash al dashes. Or... I, there's going to be some al dashes. Yeah. So start with uh, Jaish e. Mohammed. I've never heard of him, but if I had to guess, um, then you've got the. He's uh, the a boxer. <laughs> <laughs> you've got the Hassam movement in Egypt, then Boko Haram, Al Qaeda, ISIS, 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 anarcho syndicalists. Assholes. Boko Haram, ISIS, <laughs> Boko Haram, ISIS, 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 Al Qaeda, ISIS, ISIS, Al Shabaab, Democratic Liberation Forces of Rwanda, ISIS, 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 Taliban, ISIS, 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 Donetsk People's Republic, Taliban, Lak. Shar E. Ganvi, I don't know. ISIS, ISIS, Boko Haram, the Christians we just talked about. So, yeah, they're also on the list. <laughs> they're there too. And they're also motivated by religion. They're also a problem with Christianity. And we also won't get any emails telling us how many Christians there are and how hard it is to be one in North Korea because of this story. So. <laughs> hmm. Or the next one, or the one we do after that, or any of the other 222 what is, episodes. What do you call half of, of a double standard? <laughs> standard. A quadruple standard? <laughs> he said there'd be no math. <laughs> and in Homo Thapians news tonight. You'll get that later. It's really great. Missouri State <laughs> Rep and Google result for the words the cross and rapist, in quotes, Rick Bratton <laughs> fell for one of those trick are gay people human questions this week? What? what? Uh, pound of feathers. No, God hates <laughs> fags. Same thing. Fuck. That's, <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> yes. Arguing in favor of a bill in Missouri that would make it more difficult for former employees to prove discrimination cases, Bratton, who obviously didn't get the whole we don't say what we think out loud memo from the Republican Party, and explained that such protections would impede on the religious liberty of other citizens, saying, actual motherfucking quote, when you look at the tenets of religion, of the Bible, of the Koran, of other religions, there is a distinction between homosexuality and just being a human being. And actual quote. Fuck. Hold on, though. Hold on. In fairness, he does make it sound like like an X Men enhancement sort of thing, like being a, it's like you're just a human or you're gay human. Oh, thir thirty seconds. Oh, fuck, we've done that one. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, isn't that the how can it be racist if I'm saying they're better at dancing defense? Exactly. Though, ultimately? Yeah, it's a compliment. <laughs> you're racist for not accepting the compliment. <laughs> anyway, Bratton failed to comment on what the distinction was, but I, for one, would like to guess that he thinks gay people are some kind of bird. <laughs> the plumage. Here we have the red-breasted gay person. See how they all swerve to avoid predators? Fascinating species. Fascinating. <laughs> gay people evolved from dinosaurs. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> Hear their mating call. Grinder, grinder. <laughs> so yeah, an adult currently serving their third term in Missouri's House of Representatives thinks a good counter to anti-discrimination laws is the sarcastic beginning to one of Noah's diatribes from last year. <laughs> if only there were some sort of system where we could empower the people who live in his district to fire him. Some sort of phone call based system that would remind people in the 55th district of Missouri to do a thing. And then he wouldn't have a job anymore. I don't know. Daydreams. Daydreams. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, maybe Trump will put his home number on a post-it note. <laughs> and in... What did Bangladesh do? Hold my fake beer. News tonight. The government of Pakistan sent out a mass text last week to all the cell phones in the country, reminding everyone that it's the responsibility of every citizen to help get atheist bloggers murdered with machetes. Pretty sure that was the idea. 
Only you can prevent tourist fires. <laughs> that mascot is unpopular. By the way. <laughs> See, I agree. They should have gone with your machete boop idea. Thank you. Do not go horrible. <laughs> yeah. So I'm guessing Pakistan saw a picture of the Bangladeshi police posing with a bunch of atheist corpses. Like they just caught a school of sharks on giant hooks and nobody wants to start falling behind the regional competition. So they sent out a message about their blasphemy laws. According to the mass text, quote, uploading and sharing of blasphemous content on the Internet is a punishable offense under the law. Such content should be reported on info at pta.gov.pk for legal action, end quote. Also known as a harambur alert. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, if this hasn't occurred to you listening already, you have access to that email address. So, you know, <clears throat> dicks out for harambur. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me check with Andrew. On the legality of running a surprise online, most blasphemous dick pick contest against a foreign government's will. But um, I mean, I feel like no legislator would have thought about that one yet. We might be good, but let me double check first. Before All right. Good, good. Sponsor it. All right. Well, I'm obviously against this policy in Pakistan because of all the murdering and whatnot. But we like to be fair and balanced here on the Scathing Atheist. So, Eli, you hate the First Amendment. You hate freedom. Yeah. too. Would you be able to lay out the argument in favor of blasphemy laws for us? I would. Thank you, Heath. Well, as many people with half my education and understanding of these subjects have told me multiple times, the most important thing to me is people's feelings. So let me ask you this. <laughs> have these so-called blasphemers considered checking their not believing in magic privilege? <laughs> Zoom. Zoom. Heck, mate. Yeah. Tough call. Words can hurt. Just like swords. It's hard to, yep. hard to say which. And not getting to lecture wherever you want on why black people smell different is just like blasphemy laws. Exactly. We all agree everything here is identical. There is no subtlety. <laughs> I not I don't wanna I don't wanna play. <laughs> I, ab I abstain. There's no subtlety. First Amendment's important. Anyway, bottom line, <laughs> everyone should definitely the uniquely not American send idea off is talking about the exchange of ideas. He wasn't talking about Twitter harassing thirteen year olds. <laughs> Bottom line, everyone. <laughs> it's my everyone, story. Everyone, my story. <laughs> <laughs> Bottom line, everyone should definitely not send thousands of fake tips to info at pta.gov.pk because that would clog up their inbox and really make things difficult. So again, do not repeat. Do not figure out how to route your spam bot through Pakistan and send thousands of real sounding but actually fake leads on blasphemers to info at pta.gov.pk. Yeah, and don't sign them up for spam lists either or the FFRF newsletter or just send them our show. Again, don't do any of those things, yeah, any or, of them. Yeah, and also don't include a dick pic. But, but for realsies on mine, though, for realsies. <laughs> and in all Thetans are liars news tonight, all facilities <laughs> operate. Thank you. Thank you. I was quite proud of that. All facilities <laughs> operated by the Church of Scientology in Cannon County, Tennessee, have been closed down after wait. police <laughs> reportedly found a man being held against his will. Wait, wait. Cannon County? See, that's your first mistake right there. Don't go places named after old timey weapons. Yeah, that, right. Welcome to Blowgun Township. No, <laughs> nope, not coming in. Here in Chicken Sickle County, Alabama, we have every bit of sophisticated to settle on. Yeah, no, no, I get it. Anyway. Welcome to Trey so, Boucher Josephine. He's a special. <laughs> nope, nope. Don't want to eat at your restaurant. We're just going to ignore that Noah knows of a weapon called the chicken sickle we're all just gonna <laughs> we're just gonna continue our lives like the clucker machine he's got the is it all chicken based your old timey knowledge is it all chicken related that's how, how we paid doctors back in my day yeah exactly anyway according to this victim uh, he went to this scientology thing with promises of rehab and wound up trapped in a rundown trailer where he was mistreated and given unknown medications for nine months and while that more or less exactly matches my experiences living in Tennessee, this guy didn't do it on purpose. So it's against the law. I mean, yeah. Who'd have thought a cult started by the fourth worst sci-fi writer ever wouldn't be the best way to help with your addiction? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it needs to be the number one worst sci-fi writer. Muslims pretty much never have addiction problems. <laughs> Good they don't. nominee. Name a Muslim with an addiction problem. Right. Okay. All right. Well, you name a Muslim. Just name any Muslim person toast so, 
<laughs> so apparently, after months of living out an uncomfortable porn that you kind of wish you hadn't started jacking off to, but it's a little too late to find something else now. Most to X. This, this dude <laughs> manages a 911 call. <laughs> the cops find him two shades away from chained in the Brother basement toast. like sloth. <laughs> Jesus. I'm going to try to do this story anyway. So three men have been charged in the games. Toast to the bow tie. <laughs> Like any toast necessary. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So two men were uh, were charged with false imprisonment. <laughs> another one for facilitation of kidnapping. <laughs> Eli's gone now. He's checked out. He'll be back by the next story, I'm sure. Other charges may be forthcoming in this one, of course. But it doesn't look like they're going to include everyone who fucking works there for running a fake healthcare facility with no licensed healthcare providers because they're a religion and apparently that still makes it okay. I want to be a church. No, I know. I know. I get it. Yeah. So I, I feel like this one's pretty simple. Either Eli should be allowed to have a fleet of slave ships full of kids or. Religious legal exemptions are stupid. One of those is true. One of those things is true. And yeah. Ooh, true. Ooh, I know this one. The kids stood on a block of ice. That's not what this is. <laughs> that's not they, what we're talking about. They will, about. though. They oh, will. Gosh, yes. <laughs> when they're bad. <laughs> and in what's the harm news tonight? You know, so often when tragedy strikes, we wonder to ourselves, what could I have done? How could I have helped? And if you're Pastor Terry Fox, the answer is decide whether or not someone is mentally ill or chock full of demons. Ooh, I know this one. I know this one. <laughs> that makes one of you. Yes, almost a week before she would murder and decapitate her ex-boyfriend's mother, Rachel Hilliard asked her friend for a recommendation for an exorcist. And unluckily for both the victim and the perpetrator, Fox was happy to oblige. I, I feel like if the Scientologists hear this, they're going to be advertising their lack of decapitations compared to other American religions. Though. <laughs> Where's that Saber Super Bowl mentions. commercial? You're right. Is <laughs> Bernie gets on the subway? Isaac Hayes walks up. Hey, grab these cans for a second. You look, you look stressed, man. <laughs> two Bernie yeah. gets jokes in two weeks. Why? Because we care. <laughs> That's why. Anyway, Fox, who runs Summit Paranormal Investigators, has spent more than 30 years stopping the mentally ill from receiving treatment. And yep. Hilliard is just his latest victim. But don't worry, Fox hasn't learned his lesson. Speaking to the oh. Wichita Eagle, Fox said, quote, we were in the process of trying to evaluate her situation to see if she was mental or demonic, end quote. Spoiler alert, it was the first one. Is the first yeah. one mm -hmm. uh, of his interaction with an obviously mentally ill person in need of help. He further said, quote, we were only working with her a few days. If we had had an opportunity to get to her, I believe we could have helped. I think if we would have had more time, perhaps we could have made a difference. It broke our <laughs> hearts. And quote. It was with the exorcism, it was, it they could have made yeah. a difference with the exorcism. It's just that it didn't have enough exorcism sessions. And That's shit. God, Buster damn it. always gets us. I mean, he, you know, Satan jumped into Fox at the end there, and there wasn't a statue that <laughs> fell down with a sword. I get it. Uh, he went on to not add, I mean, not enough to stop doing this, but, you know, it's always a bummer when the woofle dust doesn't make the cray cray go away, <laughs> end quote. It was like there should be a reality show with like exorcists competing in a tournament somehow. It's like yeah. an entire year of James Randi giving out zero points yeah, for everything. Right. I'll tie it again. <laughs> okay, now exercise the demon while she's covered in styrofoam peanuts. <laughs> and dice beat you again. It's fine. <laughs> anyway, Hilliard awaits trial, and we hope treatment, and Fox, as a religious leader, unlike anyone else in the world who might have behaved this way, is not being kicked in the nuts by a conga line of the friends and family of the victim as punishment. <laughs> And on the shocking realization that a conga line could be worse, I'm going to need a minute, so we'll pause for a quick break and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It's a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. Well, it's that time of year again, Mother's Day. 
And look, I know about half of y'all are thinking to yourself, what the fuck is she going to talk about when it comes to Mother's Day? But the other half knew exactly what I meant before I said it. Because this time of year, while it's wonderful for some of us, can also be very painful because not all moms have behaved well. And man, was this point brought home to me by a blog sent to me several times this week, written by Kim Hickenbotham of Mourning Her Son. Not because he died, but because he was gay and getting married. As much as I usually link shit and cite my sources, I don't want to give this bitch the clicks and y'all have Google if you care to read it. But trust me when I say this is the narrative I've heard, not just from the mothers of the LGBTQ community, but of non-believers as well. I'm not abandoning him. He abandoned me for sin. Love isn't the same as acceptance. Suck my clit, lady. Look, we did a lot of nice, cutesy, give your mama hug shit for Mother's Day stuff, but let me be the millionth person to say, fuck this piece of shit. Fuck her moralizing, judgy, false mourning. How dare you insult the mothers who have lost children by comparing it to your own bigotry and lack of understanding. And while it would be perfectly fair for me to go all Timothy on your ass, I'm going to use you as an example of something positive instead. So this is for you. Yeah, you listening with a shitty mom who said you were less than because of who you are and what you believed, fuck her. If you're going to trust me on anything, it's that you make the realest family you've ever had in this life. And that bitch didn't deserve you. You're a better child than she deserved. And if you want to be, someday you'll be the mother she couldn't be. So for those for whom last Sunday didn't mean awkward phone calls and flowers, happy Sunday to you. And happy motherfuckers day to her. Thank you, Lucinda. And in think of a bummer between one and ten news tonight. As if I didn't already have enough reasons to hate Rick Joyner this week, the pastor and human being voted most likely to be hunting-themed painting of Santa brought to life by a witch announced that he'll <laughs> soon be horning in on my side gig. Um, getting paid to have little kids sit on your lap, the gun store, um, thumb lights, thumb pencils. What's your gig? Making me edit out jokes at the beginning of this episode <laughs> <laughs> no no none of those uh joiner added this week to his list of claims which include already resurrecting people from the dead feels like that would have been more newsworthy <laughs> uh making it rain inside a building pretty sure you just set off the fire sprinklers and preventing any hurricanes since katrina are you sure about that bro <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he added to that list the ability to tell the future and I speak for bar mitzvah workers everywhere when I say, I am shook. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the scoop on this. Joyner said in a sermon that very soon we'll see Christian prophets who can see the future a week in advance and may <laughs> even be able to start putting out newspapers what? a week in advance, including <laughs> sports. Wait, wait, but why seven days exactly? The, like the bookies are just going to close the betting for stuff eight days in advance. Right. right? Like Rick Joyner and God should have seen that coming. <laughs> Wait, but easy loophole. But he's seen the future, and in it, he can see the future. Wait, <laughs> when does he think the present is? <laughs> and he's gonna he's gonna use it to put out newspapers. <laughs> so that's the best thing he come up with. <laughs> Early editions. Extra, extra. Who wins the twenty twenty <laughs> election? What am I supposed oh, to yeah, fucking just... read that? How many trees <laughs> did you make that out of? Like eight. This is. <laughs> We invented this when trees were like a forever thing. <laughs> now, aside from the fact that Noah just blew my mind about the seeing the future when you can see the future thing, we might be skeptical, but listen to this rock hard evidence of what happened to himself and fellow pastor Bob Jones last year. Quote, we were having a conference when the World Series was going on and Bob and I both got some of the scores of the games before the games were played. We didn't tell anybody <laughs> We wrote them down, hit them, <laughs> but didn't tell anybody because we didn't want anybody gambling on them. Oh, oh quote. <laughs> Why write it down then? <laughs> you got this bad going, all right, let's write it down, but hide it. <laughs> for don't. them, Heath, for them. <laughs> I can be psychic if you're not looking. <laughs> <laughs> so much of my job. So, so much of my job. <laughs> Why don't you just show me the paper first and I'll tell you because then <laughs> just do the thing. Don't be a dick. It's normal. So you know you can't look at it. It's my book. And while I wait eagerly for Rick's one-man show, trust me, I totally knew that when we were in Vegas, I'll be looking for a new hobby nobody respects, but is somehow still difficult. Oh, 
Maybe you could be a podcaster. <laughs> nah, I, I hear that's super easy. You just yeah, like no, get just together, three guys, funny friends, yeah. hang out in the garage. <laughs> and in apostating the obvious news tonight, Portland State University graduate student Andy No was fired from that school's newspaper last month after he sent out a tweet that was deemed by his editors to portray Muslims in a negative light. And in the defense of that editor, the tweet in question was a video of a Muslim student explaining the Quran. So, yeah. Definitely portrays Muslims in a negative light. Is there no end to the madness? No, we finished it up last year. Where do you cherry pick from the Quran? Yeah, right. Here's a passage about your mom's butthole. No murder for this entire page. Sorry, paragraph. Al Akbar. No murder the entire paragraph. Al Akbar. All right, so this video in question was obtained at an interfaith panel sponsored by the university where students from a variety of minority religious backgrounds were invited to dispel popular misconceptions about their beliefs. The panel included a Hindu, a Muslim, a Jew, and an atheist, and a punchline involving a bartender, I assume. <laughs> uh, see, they should have gotten Heath, two for one. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I've heard this one. The punchline is, uh, bartender says, get the fuck out of here. You've been right? to Georgia. Um, Maybe it's a feel-good Budweiser ad? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now, so during the panel, the Muslim student is asked if the Quran really calls for the death of non-Muslims. And to his credit, the kid answers honestly and says, yep, that's what it says. But not, but we're also allowed to humanely banish them to another country if we want. So no tweeted out the video of this answer. And that is what got him fired. OK, but did no include the part where he said stop me if you've heard this one because <laughs> that's that's important no he didn't uh, the, the, the tweet read in its entirety at portland state interfaith panel today the muslim student speaker said that apostates will be killed or banished in an islamic state and then included a 40 second video clip of the answer which said exactly that like for my money that's as good a summary of those comments as can be squeezed into 140 characters or less. But just to make sure, no sent out a second tweet later, including a longer segment of the video with a bit more context. But because no amount of context can disguise the bloodthirsty xenophobia at the heart of the Islamic faith, the university pretended the real blame for the words belonged to the ink. <laughs> Well, if you made a word mosaic of the Quran with 140 characters, there's no way it doesn't contain kill and juice. Right. Like Guaranteed. You, you, you imagine like the thing on Facebook that shows you which words you use the most and they're bigger or something like that. <laughs> a word cloud. Juice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. tiny, tiny words around it. You guys are, are bigots. Let me explain. <laughs> most people don't mean what they say when they say <laughs> so. they like that book. So did you even think of that? Hey. According to studies, most people are liars. <laughs> what now, bigot? How come you never talk about other liars for the rest of this show in every other story? How come you don't? So according to No, the tweet was dubbed predatory and reckless by his editor, who accused him of putting the Muslim studi student and his family at risk. Uh, of a murder spree? Like, <laughs> Well, you never know. She further said that the tweet implied the student advocating the killing of atheists, which is exactly what yes. he had just advocated. <laughs> he, he, I mean, the, the tweet left out that the advocacy was regional, I guess. <laughs> in his defense, no point out that this isn't exactly an isolated view or a slip of the tongue type thing, since in more than one in four Muslim majority nations, apostasy is punishable by death. But still, just because a person advocates killing you, that's no excuse to be honest about it. But but in three out of four Muslim majority nations, they're liars. You guys aren't <laughs> giving the liars the, the praise they deserve. <laughs> Actual feedback we will get about this yep. story. Nope, you're right. Praise the liars more. <laughs> Islam's the worst one. And finally tonight, from the Ignorance is Bris file. Norway is considering a new law that would make it illegal to mutilate a child's penis with a knife. Now, it seems like this would already be covered by existing regulations about, like, knives or children or penises or, or adults, think? but it turns out it's not. I don't know. I think it's like a fun riddle for the aliens when they come. Like, okay, great. Hear me out. What can you do with a knife and a child and a penis and not get in trouble? <laughs> Only one combination is allowed. <laughs> Are you, I feel like you're forgetting that one of us is a juggler, bro. <laughs> two combinations. As long as you don't drop, there's two right. combinations. Penis juggling. <laughs> 
Okay, so under the new law, the age of consent for doing knife stuff on penises would be 16. Now, yeah, I'm glad they're trying to improve things, but I feel like this isn't quite strict enough. When I was 16, if like a girl offered to blow me, I would have happily let her cut off some of my penis. Happily. I feel like we dated some of the same girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, she describes you more like a father figure. Whatever, we're getting off track. <laughs> you too. Inter it's funny. <laughs> So, We're talking about age, right? <laughs> so, what about of, Norway? <laughs> back to Norway. <laughs> My <laughs> story, mine. <laughs> First Amendment's important. In terms of penis cutting, I'm saying maybe just like no doing that at all. Or, you know, at least pump the age a little more than 16. Mm, I don't know. When I was 16, there was nothing quite so dear to me as my penis. Like, pretty sure I would have gone all taken about my foreskin at that age. <laughs> <laughs> it terrified me. I'd, I'd love, though, to get through one record without hearing about Eli's long history of love for 16-year-old penises. I was just for my birthday, maybe next year. We could <laughs> you knew who I was when you hired me. <laughs> <laughs> you did not mention this early on. You snuck this in. Anyway. Be so a better interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> So the news from Norway came just after Belgium passed a new law that will make it illegal to chop the head off a fully conscious animal with a sword. But, you know, that fucks up the whole spell when you're talking about kosher magic. So groups like the European Jewish Congress were already freaking out. They actually called the new rules about slaughtering, quote, the greatest assault on Jewish religious rights in Belgium since the Nazi occupation. End quote. <laughs> Seriously? You're not going to let me go for a twofer with this cow's head and this kid's dick? This is just like when you loaded us into trains and gassed us. Just <laughs> like that. Well, I mean, <laughs> if true, what they're saying is, hey, Belgium, you guys have been killing it since the late 40s or so, since about 45. <laughs> really doing a great job. No, I feel like this always ends up being unpopular. You guys are always yelling at me about it. But if we're being legitimate skeptics, it's important to acknowledge that this is one of those times when the Nazis have it right. They oh, do. Geez. What now? It, it's the Jews' fault. It is. Oh, God. Nazis, okay, obviously a broken watch, Nazism, but twice a day, it's, <laughs> it's Jews' fault o'clock. And that's because in Norway and most of the world, you're still allowed to chop off pieces of a baby dick for a ghost. And it's, it's actually happening way more than twice a day. I was being nice about that. And yeah, it's all no. thanks to Judaism. <laughs> Okay, well, also 1950s American fears about masturbation. I'm just saying, like, oh, like the Jews started it, but then it caught on, you know? Yeah, no, you're, you're, no, that's fair. That's fair. I honestly, I feel like Heath just sucking up to those Muslim apologists now by trying to make the Quran sound good. Um, now, I, I also want to point out to all the people that argue that there are health benefits to circumcision. You know what? I, I'm pretty sure you're right. Actually, I've looked into this quite a bit. There's not enough baby dick studies under my scholarly belt, but. A, the health benefits are non-existent in countries as wealthy as Norway, if there are any. B, this isn't an argument about medical circumcision. They still allow that. It's about religious circumcision. And C, most of the time when you cut something off your body, it, that part is going to be less dirty later. I feel like there's a slippery slope problem in the waiting here. <laughs> uh, fallacy. Fallacy. <laughs> the informal fallacy. My left nut is perfectly clean. <laughs> Because I cut it off. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to clear something up. I feel like you might be thinking, hey, Heath, you're anti-Semitic. This story is Get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Rick Joyner over here. All right, okay. Well, what card am I thinking of? <laughs> <laughs> the point is, whether or not that's true about me being anti-Semitic, this story has nothing to do with it. I'm, <laughs> I'm anti-blank to whatever extent that blank is causing grown men to hold down a baby, cut off a piece of the baby's penis. And then sometimes blow the baby at the end. And I don't usually say this, but the blowjob really has no effect on the math. Still bad. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Still doesn't anyway, anyway, we're obviously going to need 30 seconds on the clock. We're looking for ideas for the anti-circumcision public service announcement. Go. Oh, I'm good at this one. I'm not. Only you can prevent foreskin pliers. <laughs> another, another very unfortunate mascot. <laughs> hey, it's me, Petey the Plier. Right. Uh, the Moyle, you know, is probably committing a crime. Stop him. Stop him. Um, 
It's better to be brist on than brist off. We demand reparations. <laughs> <laughs> if your hepatitis sees something, say something. Uh, how about uh, like a gruff McCrime doc? Uh, don't take a bite out of Jaime. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are many ways to skin a cat. Also a penis, but still don't. Why do we have that expression? That's weird. Because uh, foreskin is power? <laughs> Normalize the foreskin. Um, all right. If you see a baby's penis, don't do anything to it. Just leave it. Everything but leave it is weird. You're weird. <laughs> Stop it. The more you know. The more you know. And confident that we've protected enough baby dicks to call this segment a humanitarian effort. I suppose we can close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Eli hates freedom. And when we come back, Lucinda will be here because no three people can make fun of all the stupid in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> When you're driving across Texas, few things seem as appealing as not driving across Texas. So as you eventually approach the border, you become increasingly excited about the prospect of being done with that fucking state. And of course, it's only after you reach this long sought after boundary that you realize nothing changed and you just celebrated being in Arkansas. And it's with a similar <laughs> shade of disappointment that we rejoin the Book of Mormon, having finally escaped from the drudgery of Nephi only to find ourselves in the drudgery of Jacob. What's that? Can we just like go to the airport metaphor and fly to another book? <laughs> just do what we want. Noah stopped at Holy Book Security yelling at Moses. This doesn't even work. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, also joining us in this exploration of the place where Joseph Smith's imagination is supposed to be is my lovely wife, Lucinda. Lucinda, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like we could all get out of this by pleading the eighth. Yeah, the eighth just amendment saying. is important. He called you old before, and like, he was like, "You're old," and I was like, "What? Yeah, don't say that about Lucinda." And he was like, "I don't care. Whatever. I do what I want." It was a whole thing. She listens oh, fuck to you the guys. episode, man. Um, so all yeah, no, time. no eighth amendment pleading. Otherwise, Eli would end up doing god awful races with Heath or something. We, we just we. <laughs> yeah, we have to make fun of really white people instead. So book a Jacob. Good. All right, fine, fine. <laughs> so we open up this book 55 years after the Lehigh clan left Jerusalem with Jacob taking over the narrative with a sheepish, my brother also said I got to carve plates opening. Yeah, so. it really plays like little brother also had a tag. Like he, he said I could write all the stuff most precious to me, but he, he called all the Nephite history stuff, so I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the deal with airline food, which will come to pass? I'm just covering uh, everything he did. Phrase. Jews and the Philistines aren't getting along. Have you heard about this? Have you seen this? Have you heard about this? <laughs> but seriously, folks, we need a shared state. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> But eventually it comes to pass that Nephi dies, and apparently he was holding the whole nation together with shoestring and chicken wire because he's gone 50 seconds before everybody's raping each other's ear holes and shit. Yeah, yeah, right. It all goes to hell quick. I love to, he starts to give all the clans names. Mm -hmm. He's like, there was the Jacobites, the Josephites, the Zoramites, but I'm I'm not keeping track of all that shit. Neither are you. Nephites are the good guys. Lamanites are the bad guys. Right. Moving on. <laughs> Like he's trying to explain Book of Mormon lore to you while you're in line to see the movie. It's like you don't have to read yeah, the right. comics. It just helps. <laughs> just helps. <laughs> also, apparently, desiring many wives and concubines is listed here as a wicked practice. Right. Jacob 115. It says so. Right wicked fucking awesome. <laughs> smart. This book is way more fun if everyone has like an over the top Boston accent. I think it's more fun that True way. True of everything except Boston, actually. We're going to pack this and they still submarine. hate black guys. <laughs> <laughs> so in chapter two, Jacob sets out to do something about all this cavorting and lustfulness. Um, so he goes to the, I don't know, the national podium, I guess, <laughs> and, and addresses everyone. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and this chapter captures Mormonism better than anything else in the book so far because what we've got here is Jacob bothering people that would rather not listen to him and very impolitely explaining how much better than them he is. Mm -hmm. So after eight verses of apologizing, he lets loose and calls them a bunch of wound-enlarging, broken-hearted gold searchers. Yeah, and then he goes <laughs> hard commie. Yeah, yeah. No, nobody show the verse about using your wealth to help the poor to Mitt Romney. His, his poor heart can't take it. It's been a <laughs> rough year for old Rom Rom. <laughs> And God said, no starting companies with death squad money from El Salvador. And get rid of those binders and your face can't be a perfect rectangle. 
<laughs> feels personal. Come on. Can't get it right. Yeah, but but for all the setup here, he has very little to condemn them with. I mean, like he's eight chapters, he's laying out a downright Canadian preamble. But when he gets to the heart of the criticism, it isn't like you know those chipmunks are never going to fully recover from that, guys. It's how about you kick Frankie a couple bucks now and again here and there. Yeah, right. But but then in verse twenty two, he says, "All right, enough about pride. Let's move on to dick stuff, shall we?" <laughs> So first things first, God clarifies that David and Solomon grossed him the fuck out with all those wives. He may have said repeatedly in the Bible that he loved the hell out of those guys. But between us white guys, they were gross. <laughs> <laughs> well, and apparently Joey's playing a long con here because he doubles down in verse 27 of chapter two and says, in no uncertain terms, one wife, guys. Yeah. One. one. Unless, unless, <laughs> as he says in verse 30, God needs a bunch of babies, which, hey, conveniently is exactly what God is going to tell Joseph Smith. Spoiler alert. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and then just to make sure everyone knows Jacob means business, we close this chapter by saying that these guys are even worse than the Lamanites. Uh, there's there's a Wilt Chamberlain joke here. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a Neville Chamberlain joke, too. Yeah, maybe. Mm. It, it the there's Nazis a piece of like ass in our time. <laughs> Now, just because that was the end of the chapter doesn't mean that was the end of the tirade. It, right, it would be like if the diatribe ended, the headline <laughs> thing came up, and I just started bitching about the same thing <laughs> some more. Oh, and another thing about those fucking evangelicals. <laughs> right. Yeah, so now we move on to the what's God going to do to you portion of the program. And the answer is apparently make you a black person. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, pretty much. Yeah. Am I reading this right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And that's Mormon God for, I'm going to turn around this car right now. I'll make you black. I'll fucking do one, two. That's what I thought. Yeah, so apparently the Nephites have gotten so bad that God's threatened to send in the B team. He's like, fuck, man, even a Lamanite wouldn't have fucked that. Oh, Jesus. Also, it comes really close in verse five, just saying the Lamanites who you hate because they're black. The actual phrase is because of their filthiness and the cursing which hath come upon their skin. Yeah, uh-huh. But, and we should point out in this chapter, he calls them filthy several times. But yeah. to be fair, he doesn't draw any conclusions from how filthy they are. So, you know, why are you afraid of science? Why are you afraid of science? <laughs> <laughs> oh, all of a sudden you're on board with phrenology. I get yelled at oh, every God. time. You get brought up. <laughs> Eli's fine, whatever. <laughs> Which amendment is that? <laughs> <laughs> Now, in, in case you missed the more subtle hints of racism here, Jacob worries aloud in verse 8 that if the Nephites don't change their ways, quote, I fear that their skins will be whiter than yours. Right. The skins quote, of the, yeah, exactly. The skins <laughs> of the Lamanites. So basically, this whole chapter is be careful or you'll wind up black. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they still use this. I mean, this is not the holy book of the ancient Akkadians no. or anything. This is the one they're walking around with now. now. Yeah. Well, now I'm embarrassed about embroidering. Be careful, you'll wind up black onto this pillow. <laughs> <laughs> he also wraps up by saying that he also warned the Nephites about fornication and lasciviousness and every kind of sin. And I'd love to see how that went. Every kind of no hand jobs, blow jobs, butt stuff. Apparently someday there's going to be something called a vibrator. That's out. Uh, no mixed fabrics, no eight legged grasshopper eating. Can somebody bring me food? This is going to be a while. No head on parking. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Gross. He even described in perfect detail what a puzzle in a thunderstorm was. And and, <laughs> and we found the plate, but you can't see it. It's no. us. Yeah, it's, no. We found it. We dig it up. He'll take it back. Let's just say the prostitutes in Moscow told us to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't even tell us which bed Trump used. <laughs> This book spends an awful lot of time promising us that it could have been better, too. Doesn't it? Yeah. Well, well, not just that. We get a great little kicker. He says, these are the plates of Jacob made by the hand of Nephi, the guy who died in chapter one. <laughs> yeah. What, what's the ancient Jewish version of squish, squish, squish? <laughs> <laughs> um, scrape, scrape, scrape. <laughs> <laughs> And you can tell people were still bitching about that last chapter, too, because this one starts with Jacob saying, so, yeah, about that last chapter, we have to carve all this shit into plates. I couldn't list all the sins. I'd be chipping away all fucking day. So, you know, moving <laughs> on. Should have gotten Noah. He spell checks. Sometimes he rewrites your jokes so they're funnier or not nonsense. It's great. I'm just saying it's great. Yeah. No, it's it's, it's great. great is also the word I was thinking. That's of. his sarcastic voice. Like there's a lost tablet somewhere that just says like 
TLDR, uh, Joe gets a harem, black people are gross, TTYL. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's also a little, boy, those ways of God, so mysterious, am I right? Yeah, this is amazing. Okay, he gets so deep into talking about that that he almost talks himself into atheism, right? (laughs) I mean, he's like, he's going like, I mean, it's almost like it makes no fucking sense, isn't it? (laughs) That's, as an omnipotent creature, you could speak the world into existence. That's so mysterious. (laughs) So weird. Just a crumple up the tablet and throw it away. He ends up having to etch a big strike through. <laughs> and just for like safe that. measure, he also tosses in a couple of verses of these fucking Jews, right? Yeah. He says that they were stiff-necked. Isn't that like a good thing? Good posture. Like, like keep up a keep a stiff upper neck? Um, Isn't that a- That's not the expression. Nope. Oh. Well, then I would like to go to the hospital. Like to no, be. you're just saying this because chapter five is next and it's the worst so goddamn long. chapter in the history of chapters. So long. Jesus. Uh, now, instead of just admitting that he's run out of shit to say, Jacob says, hey, do you guys remember that part of the Bible with the olive trees? That was awesome. Was it? Uh, but but first, he again reminds us the tablets are a real bitch, guys. You got to... <laughs> Scrape them for fucking ever. I'm talking Heath and Wright levels of writing speed. You know what I'm saying? Just like a hurtful. hurtful. Not everyone writes like a tween stenographer on Adderall sending a text. <laughs> Whatever. Well, and also, okay, so after he bitches about how important shit has to be before you want to carve it into plates, he pisses away 77 verses. Uh rephrasing something that's already in the Bible. But I'll sum it up for you in 14 words. Mormons are like fresh branches off the rotting tree of Israel grafted onto America. There's your whole fucking analogy. We need a travel ban on Utah. (laughs) It's after the October show. (laughs) Right. But because he doesn't get how analogy works, he has to go into weird, unrelated details. Yeah. You know, also, the vineyard owner had a dog. Its name was Rusty. It doesn't represent anything. (laughs) No. Right. And God saith he had one of those swingy fences, not not a gate. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> what is it? Uh, <laughs> and he uh, wasn't a pug because they can't breathe and that's unethical. <laughs> and unethical breed. And you I don't breathe, think I it you. would be possible <laughs> to express the tedium of this analogy without reading it to you, which we're not going to do. Don't worry. But suffice to say, it should have been over at least 11 times before it actually was. Right, right. We followed these grafted olive branches for nine fucking generations by the time this thing is over. <sighs> it's like an olive tree telling you about its ancestry.com results or something. Yeah. It's ridiculous. No, it, it goes on forever. So by the end of it, God's making the perfect olive tree in some Frankensteinian laboratory <laughs> of arboreal chimeras and I'm just going like Jesus how are there 17 more verses uh, this analogy goes on for so long that by the end of it the omnitemporal guy has died of old age <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I will say about this chapter it is best summed up by whoever writes the skeptics annotated book of Mormon when they say in their chapter summary quote this is the longest and most boring chapter in the most boring book ever written. The book of Mormon. <laughs> Amen. 31 times it came to pass that the trees were cumbered, grafted, pruned, plucked, <laughs> dunged, and digged for about no apparent purpose, except to waste 3,733 words. End quote. Shout out to friend of the show, Steve Wells. Man, I'll tell you what, he's been doing this for a minute. Yeah. He's gone through some shit, guys. Steve (laughs) Wells has seen some shit. No doubt. (laughs) But it's been too long since we threatened everybody. uh, So it's time to condemn some more folks to hell by chapter six here. And is it me or does he make it pretty clear in this chapter that the Nephites need to believe in Jesus? 500 years before he's born or they'll go to hell. Yep. I, yep. Free Jesus. It's all about fetal Jesus. They're, uh, they're called unborn again Christians. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> also, I, this occurred to me as we were reading this. Mormonism is to Judaism as Donald Trump is to CNN, oh. right? He fucking hates them and desperately vies for their approval at the same time. <laughs> also, pretty sure Donald Trump hates Jews. Huh? So... No. <laughs> After the way he treated that incredibly sweaty reporter, get out of here. I like the one who's Seriously, fucking my daughter. Jew. I like the one who's fucking my daughter. Respect. His dick wasn't in there. Mine certainly would. <laughs> oh, snap. Women voted for me. Burn. I'm president now. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of generic fire and brimstone talk, and, and then we're off to the final chapter of Jacob. 
Thank you, Jeebus. But not before he says, bye. I won't see you until we're all subject to God's pleasing bar. Huh? What? A holy chapter <laughs> that ends with bye and phrasing in a single <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Yeah, and it's the last chapter, so it's a perfect time to meet our villain. What? After yeah. Jacob says goodbye. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and another fucking thing. Yeah, and, and that would that would be Sherem, the evil person who thought he was going to tell Jacob what's what. It says he had perfect knowledge. Anyone else picturing Jacob like a couple tables over at Bar Trivia? I'm telling you, Shereem, a little Shereem for me, is working with the devil. There's no way you know Parker Posey's first film. <laughs> James Randi turns on a radio scanner, picks up the devil. Hello, Shrem. Can you hear me? <laughs> you can't. You're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Shrem's using his gift of gab for the powers of darkness to try to lead people away from the teachings of pre-Christ. But then he gets around to Jacob, who was unjewable, apparently. So they get in an Old Testament fight. Old Testament fight. Woo. And Jacob goes... You want a sign? I'll give you a fucking sign. And then ask God to smite Sherem mm -hmm. dead. And God's like, yeah, all right. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, but God lets him live long enough to tell everybody he was definitely wrong about the Jesus thing. Right. Of course. Yeah, yeah like the Canadian girlfriend Jacob totally got a blowing job from. The guy who doubted him <laughs> died saying the worst sin ever is doubting Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> Subtle. Yeah. And then Jacob ends his own narrative by dying. <laughs> he does. Just, yeah. I, I mean, he at least has a sense to say, and I'm sure I'm going to die before anything else significant to the overall plot happens. <laughs> the end. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Forget what I said before, because these plates literally end with a dude. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> That's right. A 6th century BCE North American is Israelite dies by saying... Adieu. Adieu. <laughs> Fucking bon chance. We'll always have Paris. Fuck this book. <laughs> and in closing, adieu, adieu to you and you and you. Please take this book seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, it is supposed to be hieroglyphs. So does the does the fucking Egyptian reform Egyptian say in brackets? Read this part in French. Hey. So anyway, this is the this book is the chronological equivalent of me doing an accent. But the good news is that it's over and we're done with that one. The bad <sighs> news, of course, is that after the Arkansas of Jacob, we get the Tennessee of Enos, and there's no New York at the end of this road. So enjoy not reading the Book of Mormon while you can, and the Book of Morons will return in episode two twenty five. Do we have to? Heath called you old. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Before we cue the music tonight, I want to remind everyone that our new show, Citation Needed, is now available on iTunes or wherever it is that you get your podcast. We dropped the first five episodes yesterday, so if you've been waiting to check that one out, you need wait no longer. Check the show notes for links. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday, and a brand new episode of Citation Needed, debuting at noon the following day. You can also check me out on the Odd Atheist Friend podcast, as well as the Inciting Incident podcast, both of which We'll have linked on our social media as soon as they're available. Obviously, this episode wouldn't count towards our stats if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for never giving me up, Lucinda for never letting me down, and Eli for never running around and hurting me. Fuck, that doesn't work if I save Eli for last. I also want to thank Phil and Lee from Reason is Rising for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. They sent it to me back in January, but luckily, Donald Trump jokes age well. If you'd like to check out their network of podcasts, you'll find them linked on the show notes. Don't see why everybody's got to do multiple podcasts all of a sudden. Seems greedy to me, but whatever. And most of all, of course, I need to thank this week's most humane humanists. Paul, other Paul, Kim, Casey, Ryan, Jesse, Swain, Kiwi, Zombie, Melissa, Payne, Strumpet, Vincent, Matthew, Philip, William, Dale, Paul, Saul, Morgan, Michael, and Brett. Paul, other Paul, Kim, Casey, and Ryan, whose pheromones are so phenomenal, I want to rub them on my armpits when they get sweaty. Jesse, Swain, Melissa, Kiwi, Zombie, and Payne, Strumpet, who are so badass, those elite army guys volunteer to downgrade one spot on the color wheel and be the turquoise berets. Vincent, Matthew, Philip, William, and Dale, whose erections are so elegant they put the heart in Chardonnay. And Paul, Saul, Morgan, Michael, and Brett, whose yearbook superlatives just said most. Together, this score of scandalously sculpted scathe has helped us scale up our skeptical scrutiny of Scripture's scattershot scholarships this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice to give us money, but if your virtuosity is up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, where 
whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free edition of every episode. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingads.com. And if you'd like to help but your financial situation is in a holding pattern until you find the end of that goddamn rainbow, you can also help us done by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or by telling a friend about the show or by telling a friend to give us a five-star review on iTunes. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you find all the contact info on the contact page at skinningadius.com. I would like that joke to go away, please. It's very funny, <laughs> but I would like it. Definitely go away. <laughs> whether you like it or not. It's just for us. <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2017. All rights reserved.